birthday. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it would be good if it, I guess it probably is for the best that the White House can't arbitrarily decide these things. But generally, like, it's just a bunch of guidelines. Um, and we're already, like, on the conservative side when it comes to how we're handling AI. Um, so it's more a question of how it's going to impact how the people who are, I hesitate to say adversarially using AI, but as far as our business is concerned, adversarially using AI against us, how this might affect their um, decision making and what they're going to do. Um, the right people, I mean, have signed off on it as far as like seeing the policy shops that we usually trust to tell us when something is good, signing off and saying it's good. So that's good. Um, and I think I think the order also says that every executive agency needs to appoint an, a chief AI officer and start coming up with some policy toward toward this thing, something like that. Yeah, um, I mean, it's all like draft policy guidance at this point, but I think it could be directionally good. It's hard to tell with these things. Cool. Chris, do you have audio working too? Hopefully. Hopefully yes, it works. Yes, we hear you fine. I don't know. I sometimes, at, at nine times out of 10, it's the Zoom app itself that has issues. I don't, you know, and occasionally it doesn't like one of my cameras, but who knows? Uh, so I came in at the tail end of that, but I, I've been curious to ask Aram what at the, like, the higher levels of media, have you run into instances where people are using AI to generate any kind of content or are most outlets having a corporate policy, no AI content of any shape or sort, unless it's part of the story, we need to generate something for it. Um, I mean, I think like, there's certainly no formal uh, at legitimate news organizations. There is a definitive attempt to avoid uh, any sort of use of AI to generate content. I mean, you know, these things depend often also on the individual organization and just how much uh, venture capital and private equity control is involved in it, uh, because that will definitely do things. Um, but let's see. Well, I know there have been cases in the past where reporters become a bit on the fabulous side and make things up and and I'm waiting for that to happen, but with AI as the cause for a stressed out writer. And then that be the blame. Yeah, the I mean, app, the current news thing I, I just posted, um, the, the Guardian actually, the Guardian editor actually um, yelled at Microsoft and said, hey, I need you guys to promise not to be putting AI bullshit into my publication. That's interesting. Yeah, I think the, the one place where I've seen um, the, like an actual legit news organization using AI in public, I mean, G slash O is doing it, but its legitimacy is more and more in question every day now. The other one was Gannett. Um, apparently, it, they deny it, but their writers say, hey, a bunch of review articles showed up on our reviews website. They have a wire cutter um competitor and uh they said hey a bunch of these reviews showed up there are bylines do not belong to people with any linkedin uh <laughs> seems unlikely that these are real people and they're written in the style of an ai and gannett said no it's just we hired some consultancy and the writers at that consultancy might use ai but 
yeah, Gannett also, you know, private equity is putting on a lot of pressure in their ownership. I think the the answer is generally right. Like we need accuracy and AI cannot provide that. So we try not to use it for the purposes of creating content. Um, you can see it for like preview images sometimes where they're clearly stylistic. You can see it for generating like recommendations. Obviously that's been long standing. Um, and you know, we are experimenting around with uh, using it in our engineering workflows using like GitHub slash Microsoft's Copilot. Uh, though generally that experimentation does not seem to have turned out for much. I mean, there's sort of this, in the web developer community, there's sort of this interesting conversation that's happening which is there are certain people who are not interested in using AI at all. There are a lot of newer developers, more junior folks who are very interested in using AI. And there's a discourse around this idea that like, if your employer is not providing you with a subscription to an AI assistant for your programming work, they ha that's like the equivalent of them not providing you with a laptop, right? So whether or not, whether or not this is actually useful, we may end up like adopting a subscription to it because it's part of the recruitment process as much as it is part of being useful. But like thus far, it has not been useful. And I don't see any major media organizations using like chat GPT style AI. Yeah, it did happen very quickly. Um, though like there has long been... Uh, like logic around uh, token replace, like uh, what is it? Token-based language replacement. I can't remember what the exact word is for this. Um, uh, what I'm just trying to hunt it down in my own notes here, and I'm blanking on the name of the product that we experimented with this on. Um, but like where it's not really AI so much as it is like using machines that are good at understanding like language and context and sentence structure to build sentences around like sports stats, right? So it knows when to pluralize or it knows when to um, slot things in. That's not really anything like what GPT does. Uh, um, it's just a very, very different application that uh, we've used in the past but aren't currently using. Um, kind of interesting. Yeah. I, I, I don't know yet whether or not I think that there's a use case for chatting with a corpus. Um, uh, I find ChatPT very helpful in assisting me on language tasks or programming tasks, actually. Um, so not generating stuff, but generating like little filler things that I'm looking for or context or, you know, helping with the outlines or things like that. Um, but a bunch of people are, you know, detailing a whole set of PDFs or all of my, um, uh, all of my, you know, knowledge base material for my internal knowledge base. And then you can chat with that corpus. Um, it seems like that would be a really good thing for news organizations to do because they've got this huge corpus of well-structured material. So you could go, you should be able to go. It would, sounds cool. I guess it sounds cool. You shouldn't necessarily have to, but it sounds cool to be able to go to a, a chat bot interface to the Washington Post's corpus of articles and say, so I need to know more about the context between Biden and, you know, Mitch McConnell or something, right? And get, uh, you know, a, a pros answer out of that. That seems like a really good application for chat. Yeah, I mean, the problem is right now it can still take in that entire corpus and return to you a why. <laughs> yeah, right. So cool. like one of the interesting things that we saw with Copilot now that we're doing testing is Copilot is testing like a chat bot. Um, and the chat bot you can feed um, like the, not the one that's out now, but the one that they are 
like in the process of releasing it should be out soon has like a system where you can feed a repo into it like a repository right. into it and when it responds to your chat it has citations where it says this is where i got this from click here and skip to that file and i think like if if we had a tool that worked like that that might be much more yeah possible to use but like standard chat gpt now it's just not reliably giving you true answers so yeah. not useful for journalistic organizations yeah or if you were going to have it i would think saying here is the corpus of the New York Times since the 1880s or, you know, the Wall Street Journal internally and use it as a clipping service to say, we need to know this fact at this place or this time and have it return material that you know has been written and fact-checked at some point in the past or not, you know, done. Or the other thing that I think potentially could be useful, but probably for journalists who have left bigger outlets, who no longer have editorial support for dealing with a lot of the heavy lifting. So you've got things like Microsoft Word will do a spell checker or underline weird grammar things or stuff like Grammarly will give you grammar tips about what to fix but how could you throw in what you've written and say at a that whatever that next higher editorial level is you know don't fact check me and i can do that myself but what are what is the broader public likely to call into question based on what i've written versus what else is out there and give me questions or things that i either may have missed or things that could be incendiary or problematic or, you know, just that may be factually wrong that I should maybe double check. Those kind of editorial tools would be cool rather than, hey, just write the damn thing for me, which is, you know. I was under the impression, I was under the impression that a whole lot of local news, which of course is a dying category in this country, uh, that articles about sports scores, traffic accidents, and the weather are largely being written by software now. Uh, um, no. no? <laughs> there was a big movement towards attempting to do this a couple years back. Huh. Um, right, like you could see, we were talking about then too, tw that article's from 2016, right? But like two things occurred. The first was the sense like the articles were very bland um the technology i was thinking it was nlp right natural natural language processing not uh, linguistic programming which is so no no that's fun. a that's a whole different thing yeah. um but like the articles themselves are very bland the places where the statistics are coming from are lessening um but, but also just like in theory, people want sports scores from like all sorts of levels, including even down to like their high school teams. But like the people who want sports scores don't give a shit on whether it's in a sentence or in a table, right? right. They just want to see the numbers and see who won. And so it was a lot of work that these, that a bunch of different publishers were trying to put into it when like people just wanted the numbers and the same with the weather, right? Like, you need you need a weatherman to give you context and explanations. NLP is not going to do that, and you know generative AI can't do it accurately. But if you just want to know what the weather is, you don't need someone to turn it into a sentence, right? Mm -hmm. You just want the number. And so most publishers dropped that technology. I mean, we still have it, and we still occasionally use it for a few very limited things. But like, the readers are just not interested. Um, it, it's sort of weird too, because like a lot of people don't know this, but um, there's actually an entire different writing style for sports. Um, like most publishers use AP style. Apparently, the Messenger is using Chicago style. Um, a few others use some other like uh, commonly used style systems. 
Um, but uh, the sports section has always had its own style guide and rules. Um, I think the AP has its own separate like AP sports style guide. Um, and so like people who want numbers, they don't want them in sentences. And people who want sentences, they don't want them built like NLP. They want them in this very particular style, which is descriptive in some ways. Uh, and that NLP was not suitable enough to accomplish. And generative AI is definitely not suitable. Uh, I'm trying to get generative AI to generate sports style writing is difficult. Really? You can't say like, write this the way Howard Cosell would write it to name a really ancient sports figure? I mean, maybe a lot of them have turned off the ability to do that type of query, right? Write mm. this like X would write it. Um, and they don't really understand what a sports style is because they don't really understand like style rules, right? Like you can't tell a gender of AI, like write your next three paragraphs in Chicago style. And you could tell it that, but it doesn't know what to do, right? That has to do with like, punctuation and commas and periods and it's not like if you pulled in a hundred thousand sources they're marked with whether they're chicago style right or someone else's yeah well they sort of are in the sense that you can assume that certain newspapers are going by their style guides so they're those corpuses would be you know per each of the styles Right, but it's a lot like newspapers have on their front page. We write in AP style, or we write in a house style, or we write in Chicago style. Right. I mean, one of the most fascinating things, right, is like that most newspapers do have subtly different styles. New the New York Times has its own style rules that are pretty different. Um, so does the New Yorker. So does the Washington Post, right? The AP is the bedrock, but everything that's books in our newsroom that are built up on top of that and the same for most other major newsrooms interesting i remember years ago i can't find it right now um there there were so many murders in the la area that a blog showed up to basically pick up the slack that was left by the la times which could no longer post about every murder about every death um and so that and this is this is at least a decade ago i think but that that weight sort of that load got lifted by um load got carried by a local blogger that also happens a lot like if there is a demand then there's probably a local blogger who's willing to do it for themselves um uh, yeah i mean it, and that's difficult to parse through too because like what if you want to collaborate what if you want to don't want to collaborate my favorite one of my favorite uh probably told this all right one of my favorite aggregation stories happens to the Washington Post, but not while I was working for it. Back in like big prime local bloggers days, the DMV, the DC, Maryland, Virginia metro area um, had a very strong local blogger community. And the Washington Post said, we're gonna host a blogger ring um, and we're just gonna pull everything these blogs publish with their permission into an area of our site that's like the local blog site and we'll rev share with those bloggers. Um, and at the time, uh, I mean, it's still somewhat, but at the time the Washington Post had an especially conservative op-ed page. And so at some point during this time, some op-ed writer wrote a very conservative leaning uh, op-ed on the Washington Post and one of the bloggers that was in a Washington Post partner published a blog post that uh, was not happy with it. And it got aggregated onto WashingtonPost.com. So there was a WashingtonPost.com um, page, an article page, where if you loaded it up, it would just say in bright red 42 point letters, fuck you, the Washington Post. Um, and that was on WashingtonPost.com for like 24 hours before they were able to get it down. Um, so that was sort of the end of that experiment. <laughs> you still need an editorial. <laughs> yeah, hall of shame moments in major media, mainstream media. Yeah, I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? Like, 
at the end of the day, you're always going to need an editor on any of these things, no matter how professionally produced or how smart the AI is. There's no getting around the fact that like it's not. And the thing about like generative AI texts is fact checking them is harder than fact checking a, a human, right? Because like sometimes it just doesn't make sense, or it makes up citations, or like it it directs you to something that doesn't make sense for it to be a source or something like that. I mean, that's harder to check. And the same thing happens with code actually, right? This is a big problem we are facing up as some of our junior developers are playing around with using uh, Copilot, right? Is it will generate code that works, right? It executes, it doesn't throw any errors, it works but it doesn't accomplish what we needed the code to accomplish. So you end up with an entirely silent failure because it works, it doesn't throw an error, right? Whereas like if they had just tried to build it themselves and screwed something up, it would have probably thrown an error. It would have probably been closer to what we wanted it to be. And it would have been much easier to spot, right? But if something if, if something is supposed to like I don't know, just add two zeros to the end and they ask the AI for that and the AI is like, oh, here's a function back and the function back adds the number to itself twice. You'll get a number back. It's all technically correct. But if you don't catch that in code review, suddenly you have code in production that's taking your number that should have two zeros add it after the decimal point and multiplying it by itself, right? <laughs> and you don't notice until you're like, oh, these are not what's supposed to be happening here. So where do you think this stuff is going? Aram, it sounds like you're convinced that humans will always be in the loop writing most of these stories because they're, they're really necessary. Um, anybody think not? Well, it's already we already have seen physical people making up stories about things that don't happen shifting identities to the far right or far left you know so the question is does ai just help accelerate that even faster mm -hmm. you know so even if you have humans and humans actually are you know the fallibility of AI is because of the fallibility of humans to begin with. So the, even the training sets are introducing the same types of biases. So it's, you know, it's just now it's easier instead of the touch of a lot of buttons, it's the touch of one button. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. In some ways, like the people who use it for propaganda are who I'm the least worried about, right? What's much more worrying is like, it, it's the same thing that happened with cryptocurrency, right? The people who are going around promoting cryptocurrency because like it's a shallow scam that's obvious to see, I don't give a crap about those people, right? Yeah. They'd be promoting some other shallow scam. The problem is like the true believers looping in companies and individuals and entities who then go on to use the AI to accomplish things that they think work and then they don't. And that has impacts, right? Like Gannett probably paid a bunch of money for these this consultancy to use the AI to write product reviews. And now that money is burned. It's in the hole. And this is like time two, right? So like when you're a news organization that doesn't have a lot of revenue to begin with, that's bad, right? You've put yourself in a worse position that has more downstream effects that like are not obviously attached to AI, right? They're going to hire less people. They're going to have less stuff. Yeah, right? Like, I, I just, I don't know. It just seems to me like we're promoting a lot of stuff around AI that it can't actually do on the hope that one day it'll actually do it the same way we did with cryptocurrency. And the same way it was true with cryptocurrency, there is absolutely no proof that generative AI will reach the heights of the promises 
that people are making about it, which is like crazy because there's a lot of interesting things you can do with it, but not the things that people are promising in the market. Yeah, it's the same thing. Even with you know, a decade ago, it was big data was all the hotness, and I you know, I haven't heard anybody utter the phrase big data. I think this entire year. It's been a while, yeah. It all just got dumped into machine learning, really, right? So now everyone who was doing big data is now doing machine learning. I mean, it's the same thing, right? Like, what is big data for if it's not to feed it into a big algorithm that makes decisions or gives suggestions? That was always what big data was supposed to be for to begin with. So I think that one's a little different. Uh, but yeah, it is, I, I, the, the point is these things definitely go through fads. And I think it's weird because the fads are getting uh, the the rate in which fads occur is accelerating and the impact of those fads is increasing. Um, but the efficacy of what they are promoting is not getting any better, right? Mm -hmm. I think less than big data, probably a better example is like, um, I don't know. What was, there was a big fad a little while back that I'm just blanking it. Never that? Asked. What's Which? the it's the weaponization of the fads that's accelerating as well too because I remember the shiny happy days in the late seventies when pet rocks were all the rage and you know the, the cute and lovely and I, you could throw them through a window but nobody really was doing that and now look where we're at. <laughs> uh, Pete, are you more optimistic about whether I can deliver on this stuff or where would you draw a line or maybe what would be a good test of whether this is going to work? It depends what you mean by this stuff. I think that's a big part of it. Um, yeah. Um, I, I certainly agree that there's a bunch of things that that even today people expect chat GPT to be able to do, you know, oh, I think it can answer, you know, I, I think it can answer a question and I can rely on the question, you know, and and they're wrong, you know. Um, and and it's there is a super funny thing where I I tell people that people I'm teaching about ChatGPT, I say don't trust anything it says. It's going to make up answers and stuff like that. And then I'll show an example where I'm doing exactly that. Where, but I you have to have enough context to know whether uh, the the human has to have enough context to know whether or not the the answer is reasonable. So there's a there's a thing where I, I use ChatGPT all the time to give me answers, but I'm always skeptical about the answers. Yeah. So yeah. we're already in the state where, you know, the Aaron kind of discussed where, you know, people are gonna assume that it can do things that it just can't. Um, but I think, I, I don't know, I, I looked up a, there's a Twitter, a, Twitter post from a AI product manager type person who said, here's where open AI is going. They're building a new kind of computer. Um, and all of that makes a lot of sense. So what he talks about is uh, assisted intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Um, uh, generative AIs and conversational interfaces, I think are a game changer. And I think it's going to, for, I, for me, the way I think about it, conversational interfaces are, going to democratize access to computing resources in a way that we kind of saw when we went from not having PCs to having PCs. And when we went from uh, terminal mode interfaces, which were obscure for most people to GUIs. And we, when we went from GUIs to touchscreen interfaces, it, it democratizes access in a way for people to be able to use magical computing stuff in the background that was previously available to specialists, but not to most people. So conversational interfaces is going to continue to do that. And then, you know, the, the ability to do correlation of stuff to be able to ask ChatGPT, hey, I'm thinking of a song that had something, something, or, you know, what was the, what was the person's name who invented blah, blah, blah. I don't have to figure out how to frame a question I, I don't have to know the answer to frame the question well i can i can blunder at a question and conversationally chat is can help me find the answer um because it has 
and this is kind of back to you know thinking through the Washington Post corpus going back 100 years, 200 years, whatever, New York Times corpus, 300 years. Um, you know, there's something. Maybe it's not a thing that I would have the general population chatting with, but if I were a research analyst, um, being able to to you know talk my way through uh, uh, 200 years of newspaper articles to find the right thing rather than trying to use keyword searches or something like that. It, it's a game changer for that kind of stuff. Access to information, access to common sense. Um, uh, the, I don't know. I, it's it's going to continue to grow in use um, and get subsumed into other interfaces and other tools and stuff like that. It's not going to be so front and center. Right now, so ChatGPT right now is like a... a a demonstration of a GUI interface. You know, it's like, you know, it's it's like, oh my God, we have Windows and you can drag it with a mouse and stuff like that. And you know, it's a like a um, like an Alto or something, right? It's like, okay, so you know, I can buy an Alto for ten thousand dollars or whatever, twenty thousand, fifty thousand dollars. And then what can I do with it? You know, I guess I can run the demo, the same demo that the, the park guys are doing, you know. So what? That's where we are with ChatGPT right now. Um, we're going to get to the part where, you know, generative AI and conversational um, uh, linguistic interfaces are just going to be subsumed into everything. So that's the thing to look for. So one way to look at this is as a sort of step functions of progress in different subcategories of software of anything, you know, scientific or, or whatever. And I've watched as neural networks went from like, ooh, we little fledglings where they could barely do anything and then bump up and then bump up and suddenly take a, like a big leap. Like what happened kind of last December when ChatGPT came out was a pretty big leap. And the thing I'm wondering is where is the new plateau? And I think we're right now trying to figure out what is the new plateau? Because what happens is that functionality kind of settles in and then you take, you assume this set of things, you take them for granted over time, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. And in few, I won't say no, none, of the previous step function leaps in other technologies or other areas, was the technology itself able to actually help improve the step function and broaden functionality um, at the top? And I, no? PCs. Um, uh, the, you know, the third or fourth or fifth generation of PCs was developed by people who were only able to um, invent things using PCs. So there's a bootstrappy action of having better hardware to do more complicated computations in, in that sense. Okay. It's, it seems to me like the same thing, you know, um, uh, uh, an AI that can <laughs> maybe or maybe not help you do coding tasks, um, you can use it to, to build a better AI or, or like immediately kind of like examine in, instead of you know, sitting down in a brainstorming session with you and a whiteboard and, and a, a few other people, you know, it could brainstorm like 100 or 200 or 1,000 different kinds of things for you to try. And then you can march through all those things and try them, right? Um, but it's it, that feels, I, it's, it's faster than where we were with the PC thing, the bootstrapping thing with PCs, but it, it feels the same too. But you don't think somebody's using these engines to say, hey, we, we've got this sort of working pretty well over here, this working pretty well over here. What would it take to bridge those two and to create a common memory model or whatever, whatever, and see what the what the machine comes up with as a solution for the thornier problems that would break us through our evolving perceptions of the current plateau? It's, I I agree that that's going to happen. And it feels a lot like, um, you know, back in 1980, all of a sudden you have circuit simulators. And so instead of building, you know, an analog circuit and then testing it, uh, you just had the machine simulate it and go, okay, you know, I'm, now I'm going to do 10 circuits today instead of one. Same kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just don't know if history has proven out that conversational interfaces are actually powerful <laughs> or what people want to use right like i mean you could argue that maybe they're just not good enough yet but like alexa purchases and google home purchases these are all going down the use of these interfaces go down and every couple of years and this is just the perspective from working in media or my perspective from working in media we've gone through like a two-year cycle where every two years someone's like chat bots that's the ticket and each and at each time in the cycle, the chatbots are more powerful. 
And we go through the process of building them and connecting them up to your point to like our corpus of all of our information or a particular subset or election stuff. And nobody uses them. Nobody likes using them. Like ChatGPT is very fun to use as a toy. And it's very interesting to use for us as technologists who understand what we're interacting with. But does the common person want to, it's like the problem with VR shopping, right? Like, yes, you could have a shopping store that has virtual reality items on the shelf and you could walk through it in virtual reality and pick them off the shelf and put them in your cart and go to checkout. But why would you do that when you could go to Amazon and click a button and get it, um, right? Like, I think a lot of the uses of chat are the same thing. Why would you do it that way when like 90% of the time it's better to use documentation or to look it up using like an index. And I think like in some ways, the the problem is like, and this gets to the problem that most publishers have with AI, right? Like the abstraction of our data into these AI systems and then the presentation of it on the search engine is like a labor issue um, in the sense that it's like you're taking this stuff, you're representing it incorrectly nine times out of 10, and then you're not paying the people who are creating it. And eventually it's just going to be like training on itself because you've everyone who had a job to write this stuff has been fired um, and replaced with AI. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's that's great. That that was a really good rant. I appreciate it, and and, and I love the skepticism. Um, I I think um, it it will give me something to think about. So so my presumption for twenty or thirty years has been that conversation, um, especially spoken conversation, speech is is kind of the killer app for. For humans <clears throat> and that text uh, even books and things like that is going to fade away um, uh, when we get you know when we get machines that can talk better um, so i have a long-standing kind of belief in that which i you know you may or may not share which is fine um i think what you're seeing when i i agree right now that ch even chat gpt is hard to use for things like looking up stuff um or um, uh, you know, doing a, a relevance query. I, maybe you just want to go to Google and PageRank or whatever PageRank has been replaced with at this day and age. I, it's it's a different thing. Um, uh, when ChatGPT gets easy enough for most people to use, <laughs> which is a really funny thing to to say because it seems like it should be easy enough for people to use, but I'm I'm kind of literally in the business of of showing people, hey, it's, you know, let, let me help you use this thing, which seems like it's easy to use. It's really counterintuitive for most people to be talking to a machine, you know, I'd like, you know, like, okay, what do I start off talking about sports scores? And then we get into the conversation that I need to have with it? Or why don't I do that? You know, is it just going to confuse it if we're talking about the the jets and the and the whatever and then i need to ask it about you know my hvac system or something like that you know how do i have a conversate conversation with things what does this even mean and why does it tell me that you know one plus one equals three why would it tell me that you know when it was doing so well before all that stuff is super confusing for people using a chat chat bot right now having said that i find it incredibly useful now that i know how to use a chat bot and i had to teach myself how to do that um, I find it incredibly useful and more, more productive to ask a fuzzy question in the context of a conversation rather than trying to rely on an index or uh, trying to rely on uh, keyword searching through Google or you know, even asking a person. It's easier to use something that's got a conversational interface to it once you learn the rules and regulations of using a conversational interface, which right now is out of the reach of most people. So I, I, my, my prediction is um, we're gonna have another step function when, um, uh, when uh, Amazon finally gets generative AI chat hooked up to Alexa because they've been trying to do that for years and haven't yet. I think that's coming in um, in spring. I think that's going to blow people's minds. All of a sudden, you can chit chat with Alexa rather than asking it for the weather and to set a timer or whatever. 
that's going to be like a big thing. I think, I think we'll, we'll figure out how to make, I guess it'll be two directions. Regular folks will be, will figure out more how to use the chatbot and chatbot makers will figure out how to make it easier to approach and manage expectations better and uh, create better outcomes for surprises and things like that. And I think we'll get to the point where just like we saw with terminal versus GUI and GUI versus touchpad, touchscreen, I, th I think we'll see everybody move to conversational interfaces with computing and information. And I, I, that seems like a no brainer to me. And, and I think we're going to see that in the next, you know, three, four, five years. And so, so that, notwithstanding your skepticism, and I, 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 your, your criticisms are, are very astute and make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think it will be capable of executing that. Like, there's no evidence thus far. I, I understand your point. I just, yeah. I just don't see it. And like, when we see normal users interacting with chat, I don't see it there either. I, I don't know. It just seems to me like a bad way of organizing information. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I do think like, I do think if it is going to be successful, part of the thing that's going to have to be figured out is the how people get compensated when their stuff is in it. Um, <laughs> the uh, Yeah, that's right. Because I think they changed their fallback hour. They just uh, did already. and we're about to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like what's really like, that's one of the core things, right? I don't know if you read or are familiar with Brian Marchant and his book that came out recently on the uh, Luddite movement. And he goes into the history of it and like that the core of it is that the Luddites were not, though they've been re- they've been sort of reinterpreted differently in modern times when they were there the luddites were not anti-technology yeah that's the book they were pro-technology but they did not want technology to be an excuse for them to no longer be capable of making a living in the world um and the ai process is as much of a problem in that vein as it was when automation first launched then. And it doesn't even, and the thing is, right, like it doesn't even matter if it works because people are already using it to replace artists, to replace writers. It doesn't matter that it's producing shitty content and bad art that's obviously generated by AI. You know, the mechanisms of capitalism are such that you would they'd rather man the management class would rather pay less than they would pay for a quality product. Um, I don't think that they were necessarily World War One. You mean like the sa saboteurs in general, like like the, the sa saboteur comes from throwing a sabot, a uh, peasant's wooden clog, into the machinery. That, that's yeah. the etymology of saboteur. And I thought it was a World War One thing when they pressed peasants to go work in factories to make munitions or whatever. But I, could, I think it was from before that, but I'm not sure. We could look uh, it up, right? Yeah, and it's just like, it, I think that unless that problem gets solved, what will inevitably end up happening, even if even if the chat does become a mechanism that works, which I, I think we both agree it does not currently really work, but even if it does become a mechanism that works, right? There have been a number of studies that show like it takes very few generations of AI learning on AI generated content for it to start producing gobbledygook. And if the problem of the labor of producing the original content that feeds into the AI is not solved, it will eventually eliminate itself. Only all of the people who previously wrote stories and all of the companies that previously wrote the content that powered the AI will have collapsed. Uh, is sort of semi-apocalyptic for our infoscape, um, and for that reason alone, it's a it's a big problem. It, it just reminds me there was a I can't remember who wrote it. Somebody wrote a, a little tweet or a blog post or a Tumblr or something that was like, uh, "We all hoped that automation 
would free us up for, to do creative work and art and poetry. But now it turns out they've automated the art and the poetry and we're stuck doing manual labor. Um, and like, yeah, it, it's an issue. You know, a generation of creativity could be destroyed because we uh, would rather let Google turn the search page into an, a vast experiment on comprehensibility. Yeah, so um, Pete mentioned all the, the levels of increasing democratization, or you can even look at the democratization of the blogosphere that lets everybody publish their own stuff, or Twitter that, you know, goes another level further and farther and faster. Um, but then when you wonder with all these slow levels of democratization happening, at the same time, the world seems to be undemocratizing itself somehow. Um, and how do you how do you juxtapose those together to 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 fix problems that are happening? We're very rapidly running toward undemocracy, and I, I'm unclear that democracy is the best way to organize things anyway. But we're certainly on you know hitting undo on it over and over again around the world. Well, the, the, the thing that worries me too is they're within the world of philosophy, and I forget the philosopher who kind of made the analogy. Um, but he said, you know, being at war isn't the actual fighting and bullets flying. It's the thing that happens before, you know, the, the slowly boiling pot. So Israel's been at war for, you know, nearly a century now since its beginning and everybody thinks that something happened on October 7th but really it, it didn't happen they were already at war before October 7th it's just the perspective so you think about what's happening with even democracy in America and we're physically at civil war already it just we haven't gotten to the tipping point where everybody realizes were at civil war yet um and the, the question is how do how can you de-escalate it before it actually turns into fist fights and guns and shooting although guns and shooting has already even started we're just ignoring the fact that we've started shooting at each other and what you're asking is a relatively important question at this moment in our lives and in the planet's life and in humanity's life like how do we keep this from going down the tubes seems important yeah or if you were you know I, how do you how do you fix something before it's too late so if you were the king of france before the revolution what could you or should you have done to you know smooth things out or to at least to do something if not to save your own life but to so the problem, to those around you. the problem with that and similar analogies throughout history is that by the time you get to, gosh, maybe I could have done something to stop the revolution, you have to hit undo on a whole lot of layers of shit that they were doing in order to keep the nobles in place. I mean, <clears throat> part of the reason to move the capital out of Paris over to Versailles and to have these balls and to basically they wanted to drain everybody's coffers so that they didn't have more power. So they made them do a whole bunch of expensive stuff uh as an arms race to keep them poor to keep like to keep control and so many things are about control and it's different for every place and and, and era in history but it's always complicated and there's always like bitter grudges and there's always then the winners the ones we think of as winning that section of history always felt like they were going to lose at a hair's breadth all along they were like i, I could be deposed at any second yeah. and so they became paranoid and crazy and like etc yeah, right. It's the uh, it's the psychohistory question. Yep. I've been looking at um, Roman history again in like the second to first centuries, and and Rome started because of uprisings started giving away the power of the Roman Senate to the peoples they had conquered in slow fits and spurts 
to prevent mass attacks on the central government. And as that's happening, there's an internal fight with, you know, that's playing out with this, the Senate itself. And do we call a king a king or can we call a king a king? So as Augustus is coming to power, ostensibly as a king, he, you know, he used the word princeps, like I'm the first citizen of Rome, but the amount of power he had versus all the other senators was massively imbalanced. But he specifically would not use the word king to describe what he was because he knew just the word would have driven them all against him and he would have been killed the same way Caesar was. So it's, I'll, I'll take these responsibilities and a title, but st I still make sure that the senators still have enough things that make them comfortable. And that's the same thing that seems to be playing out right now in U.S. politics with Trump is I want to own the power and have all the things and all the senators and Congress people, at least on the far right, seem to be willing to give it to him as long as they stay in their positions of power and they won't say no. And so we're, you know, we're sliding down that same slope. I think ironically, it's almost even worse than that. I think the thing is that really none of them actually want power because they don't want to make decisions or do anything. They just they just want to be in the visual position of power. They want the the visuality of power, the illusion of power, the perception and of power. the perception of power. That's a, the word I was looking for, right? They want the perception of power and they happily delegate the actual work of power to a bunch of basically anonymous people who work under them right it's it's the the irony is that the republicans who go around accusing people of being the deep state are the most interested in establishing essentially that concept right and you can see it because like it's especially visible at state legislator levels where there's a humongous, a tremendous problem where like major uh, conservative um, like uh, nonprofits and um, like political organizations, lobbying groups, right? They just go around writing bills and then they hand them over to state Congress people and then they get passed. And like a couple of times they've asked, there's been interviews where the state congressperson's like, I didn't read it. I just, I, I trusted the Heritage Foundation to write a good bill, right? Yeah. Like they don't even care about actually exercising the power at all. Because if they did, then that was would not be how it would work. <laughs> well, it's the same thing with students in classrooms is no one wants to do the actual work. You just want the A or the perception of the A and the things that the A gives you rather than actually doing the work to get the knowledge and have the actual space. And well, I so think that, you see those sort of versions. Yeah. I mean, I think that though is connected to a change. Like, I think that's like not necessarily a indicator of a cultural trend so much as a, a trend in education where it's like, there's a really good book by uh, Malcolm Harris, which talks about the industrialization of the American education system. Um, I'm going to look it up real quick. Um, nope, maybe not Malcolm Harris. Uh, but anyway, the point is like what it goes into is this idea that like education, even K through 12 education, which was always initially set up in order to essentially produce skilled labor for industrialists at some points in American history shifted more and more towards like the philosophic concept of people should be educated, but now has begun swinging all the way back. And so what you're seeing in schools, especially by the time they get to college is that students are burned out the same way that people who, who work burn out, right? They've been doing homework. They've been doing going to school. They've been commuting to school. The schools start earlier and earlier. 
um, and go longer and longer and the homework gets longer and longer and the test process gets longer and longer. And none of this is learning per se. It's very mechanicized. It's about memorization. Um, and so people don't want to participate. And that's and then on top of that, your reward for participation and success is immense debt that you can't pay off and you can't get rid of. And that's why higher ed enrollment is down, right? The, <laughs> yeah. or, it's all, or it's all shifting now towards STEM degrees because you can get a job with a STEM degree that, that pays you money for things that you know versus... I think the English department at Harvard right now has, or in 2020, it had 56 professors in the English department, but only 60 people enrolled. I, you know, and that's insane. The hell a teacher and, ratio. And I think English as a major over the last decade has lost a third of its enrollment. And so you see a heavy losses of just massive cuts in humanities departments everywhere. And I, I think this year alone, there are an awful lot more of them and they're going unreported. Nobody, it's a problem. No one's talking about generally, or if they're talking about it, they're talking about a lot of the cuts that were happening and programs that disappeared just before, just at the pandemic. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Um, and it's, you know, eventually it's going to break. But there are, I know of a handful of people who are already saying, don't call your school, you know, a liberal arts education. You can't use that word anymore because you're not providing that as a thing. Maybe you know? they're all vocational schools now. And it's, yeah, and a lot of places are literally looking at. So, um, I've got a friend who was uh, a full professor who was just retrenched at a large state school in Minnesota. And literally they've decimated the humanities departments. And more likely than not, this, their solution is going to be uh, to partner with another school halfway across the state that is doing, you know, more industrial arts and welding programs and that type of training. And they're going to merge the two schools together. And it's not going to be what we would consider uh, a Western based liberal arts education of any sort. It's going to be training for physical jobs or specific types of jobs rather than anything else. And it I sort know, of, yeah sort of connects back to the problem, right? Like increasingly the roles for which creatives would be trained for are shrinking or their compensation is shrinking or both. Um, and so the argument to go to a college education for doing that, it's not great. Um, the lifetime between training and job is also long, so it's really hard to know where to aim these days because, you know, five years is a whole change in a lot of different industries. Well, that was, you know, in part, part the, the, the original figure out how to learn to think critically so that regardless of what you were faced with, you could at least figure it out. Um a friend and I have been reading through um, uh, Hitchens and Adler's book, the, the Great Conversation, which was the first book in the 54 book series of the great books of the Western world in 1952. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at a lot of that, where education has been, and there's a good bit of discussion of Dewey and what Dewey thought and how all of that impacts on democracy. Because at the time they're writing it, they're going through World War II. And it's, if we want to have a strong democracy, we need a well-educated electorate is, you know, the underlying thing. But we seem to have lost a huge amount of what that was in 19 early 1952 when it came out versus where we're at now 
and no, no one's talking about that as a thing. It's all, when you hear about education at the government level, it's education for specific jobs. How do we keep people employed and in jobs and doing things? Um, in the early 1900s, it was a lot easier because it's not until, and it's only happened in the West, it's now happening in the rest of the world, but it, in the early 1900s, you still have the vast majority of the world population working as subsistence farmers. And now they've, most of them have moved into larger cities to do physical labor, factory labor, anything but, you know, tending a farm on a day-to-day -day basis. But now that we've had that massive shift of everybody, the city and working, where do you go to next? What do you what do you grow yourself into or have we just grown so far there's nowhere left to grow to you go and to the metaverse we're chris alive. we're going to live in the metaverse together no we're not well only only this zoom metaverse but honestly it doesn't always work so we got to be careful yeah exactly um we've run over our hour um, no sign of Flancian, so I guess yeah, I thought he would show up at twelve oh one. I liked your theory; I thought that was great. I was he's, expecting he's uh, on holiday in Asia somewhere. Ah, okay, yeah, cool. Um, so shall we wrap up our show today and uh, head Lovely on back job. to the real world, which is full of these we, dilemmas? Well, I we've solved it all, so you know what else is there to do? I'm comforted by that. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Or at least Aram has, so. Yeah, yeah.